Welcome back to A Slice of Physics. Congratulations, you made it through a really long video on the previous one. I'm sorry that that was as long as it was, but it was packed with a lot of good information, some of which talked about the electromagnetic spectrum. And in this video, we're going to talk about how objects put out light across the electromagnetic spectrum, which is called the thermal emission spectrum. And then we'll see the connection that there's one property of the object that determines the entire profile of how it puts out light across various wavelengths, and that property is the temperature. In the context of this, we will see how different objects of different temperatures appear to be different colors, and we will talk about how we can use this relationship to determine the temperatures of stars. All right, so in this video, we're talking about colors of light-emitting objects. We're not talking about colors of leaves or grass or berries or fruits. Those are based on reflecting specific wavelengths of light. But here we're talking about an object glowing. So when we say emitting, we're talking about it's glowing based on its temperature. And so we're going to discuss the color of it. So the things that fall into this category would be stars, filament bulbs, the old incandescent light bulbs that we used before we came up with LED, which was more energy efficient. But the filament bulbs are a true representation of glowing based on the temperature. And you can think of this also as flames of fire falling in this category. So we see a few things. Higher the temperature is, the brighter an object is. So a higher temperature object puts out more light in totality for the same amount of surface area that's emitting the light. And then there is a profile of emission based on wavelength, which we're going to talk about. So let me introduce that. So here is a graph between wavelength on the x-axis and intensity of light on the y-axis. Wavelength increases to the right. And I'm going to set up some values here just for the purpose of talking about what our eyes can see. So I'm going to be partial to the visible part of the spectrum and delineate that. So let's say I've got wavelength in nanometers here. So 400 nanometers would be there. 700 nanometers would be here. That's the range of the visible part of the spectrum. So visible lies here. Infrared will be beyond that. Radio will be beyond that. And then on the shorter wavelength side, I would have ultraviolet X-rays and gamma rays. Now, if I have a really hot object, it's emission profile is going to look something like this. It's going to peak very early in this graph, and then it's going to drop off like this, approaching zero. If I have a relatively cooler object, but these are all still very hot objects, so this would be a hot star that would peak in the ultraviolet range. And then if I have a star like our sun, it peaks in the visible, middle of the visible part of the range. So it'll, its profile will look something like this. And then if I have a cooler star than the sun, its profile would look something like this. It'll straddle zero for a long time, and then it'll peak somewhere in the infrared part of the regime and then drop off. Okay, so in this graph, higher temperature objects go this way, right? T increasing in that sense. So the observations we see here are, number one, a hotter object puts out or emits more light than a cooler object at all wavelengths. That's an important fact. These graphs never cross each other. So regardless of what wavelength I take, the higher temperature object is going to put out more light. Secondly, a hotter object peaks at a smaller wavelength. You can see that here. The hottest object here, the lambda peak for the blue star, was somewhere in the ultraviolet range. The lambda peak for this purple drawn star was somewhere between ultraviolet and x-ray. The lambda peak for the sun, conveniently, is smack dab in the middle of our visible part of the spectrum. And then the lambda peak of a cooler star than the sun will be in the infrared regime. And it is this profile combined with what our eyes can see that determines the color of light emitting objects that we see. So there is a relationship, mathematical relationship, that determines what the lambda peak is. And the textbook gives it a nanometer, so let me be consistent with that. It is 2.9 times 10 to the 6 nanometer times Kelvin over the temperature of the object in Kelvin. So temperature and only the temperature determines the peak wavelength. So let me label some of these peak wavelengths here. 
So this is the lambda peak, whatever this value is over here would be for the purple object. For the blue object, lambda peak is here. For the green object, lambda peak is here. And for the red object, it is over here, okay? So the lambda peak of the object depends on the temperature. Let's go ahead and calculate that for a few objects. To discuss that, let me show you a picture from NASA's APOT. This is the astronomy picture of the day website from NASA. Here's Orion the Hunter constellation. And at the shoulder of Orion, you've got a star called Betelgeuse that we will be talking about. At the knee of Orion, you've got a star called Rigel we'll be talking about. But when you look at this picture, you right away see that, you know, there are some colorful things like in pink and all that, which are nebulae that are glowing based on certain electron transitions. But these dots, the stars, are glowing based on their temperatures. So we see right away that stars have colors. You might not have thought about it that way. You might think on a night sky, all these dots of stars look white. But if you look closer, you will start picking out some stars being bluish, some stars being reddish. Orion is a good example. You can go look at that with your naked eye and you can pick out the color difference between these two stars. And then you see some stars in this picture are white. So there are blue stars, there are red stars or orange or reddish, and then there are white stars. So we're going to talk about why these stars appear these colors. So to do that, let me take some examples of stars. I'm going to give you the temperatures of the stars, and then we're going to determine the lambda peak of those stars. So the examples I'm going to take are our sun. I'm going to take Betelgeuse, Rigel, the two stars in the Orion constellation, and let's see what they are. We know from observations that the surface temperature of the sun is about 5,800 Kelvin. Betelgeuse is about 3,500 Kelvin. Kelvin and Rigel is about 11,000 Kelvin. It's the hottest of these guys. So we can use our relationship. Lambda peak in nanometers is 2.9 times 10 to the 6 nanometer Kelvin over the temperature in Kelvin. So when I plug in the temperature of 5,800 Kelvin in this equation, the lambda peak I get, sorry, I'm not sure why I used mu here. Lambda is that. Um, lambda peak for the sun would be 500 nanometers. You can check that in your calculator. And then for Betelgeuse, you will get 830 nanometers. And for Rigel, you'll get 260 nanometers. So when you look at these numbers, given that visible part of the spectrum is about 400 to 700 nanometers, you can see that the sun peaks invisible. That's very convenient. Our eyes are sensitive to the light where the sun peaks. You can think of that as intelligent design. You can think of that as evolution that would lead to our eyes obviously being sensitive to the light that we get most of from our host star. Or you can think of that as the programmers who created the simulation we live in matched the sensitivity of our eyes to the brightness of our star. Take your pick. I will not think less of you regardless of which one of those choices you take, but the end result is that the sun peaks where our eyes are more sensitive. Betelgeuse peaks in the infrared and Rigel peaks in the ultraviolet. So when we put that together with this picture here, remember this is what our eyes can see. So when you look at our sun, which I've shown in green color here, our sun's putting out a lot of light in all colors that we see. The entire visible part of the spectrum that goes from red at this end to orange to yellow to green to indigo to blue to violet. So those the Roy G. Biv is all constrained within this 400 to 700 nanometers in the backward sense because red is the longest wavelength and blue is closest to the shortest wavelength. And by the way, I mixed up the B and I here, so let me fix that. So typically we think of the shortest wavelength end as blue and the longest wavelength end as red. We don't worry about talking about violet and indigo. So you can see that this green star, the sun, is putting out a lot of light across the entire spectrum. So when you go out and look at the sun during a bright day, don't do this because it'll hurt your eyes and damage your eyes, but the sun appears white. That's where you have heard the term white hot. Some of you might say that the sun is red, that's because when you can look at the sun when it's low in the horizon and filtering through a lot of our atmosphere, the blue light is taken away by our atmosphere, which is why our sky looks blue. And so the sun ends up looking a little reddish when it's low in the horizon. But when it's high in the horizon, it looks white because it's putting out colors across the entire spectrum of the visible range. But this blue star here is Rigel. And you can see that it peaks way out in the ultraviolet as we saw. But within what our eyes can see, look at its profile right here. I'm going to thicken it so you can see. It's sloping like this. 
So it's putting out a lot more blue light than it is putting out red light, which is why Sirius appears blue. And then when you look at a star like Betelgeuse, that is the red star over here, it's peaking in the infrared. So it's putting out a lot more red light than it is any other color. So Betelgeuse here will appear red. So the interesting conclusion here is that blue is hot and red is cool. So this is the fundamental relationship between temperature and color. Unfortunately, the symbols in our bathrooms are backwards. So we show blue as cold in our taps and red as hot. For some reason, we have associated red with fire and blue with ice. And so our bathroom taps have that color coding, but that doesn't fit with the reality of how stars or light bulbs or flames will look. All right, so in this slice of physics, we talked about the thermal emission spectrum. We saw that all objects emit a light profile that's determined only by their surface temperature. We saw that a hotter object emits more light at all wavelengths compared to a cooler object. And then the color a certain light emitting object appears is based on its thermal emission profile and what our eyes are sensitive to. So it's related to this peak wavelength of peak emission, which then is also related to temperature. So the way we measure surface temperatures of stars is by looking at their light profile across the wavelength, figuring out the lambda peak, which is an observable, and then using the equation of lambda peak equal to 2.9 times 10 to the 6 over temperature in Kelvin. This is in nanometers. So we can observe lambda peak for light bulbs or stars and use this equation to figure out the surface temperature. Thank you.